So I'm not going to ask you PMs. I'm not going to ask you KGBs. And it's just it's just abbreviation. You can actually abbreviate it however you want. Because when you did your test, I encourage you to write your circles. So you can write out the muscles if you want. You can abbreviate them the way it works for you. Um, you don't even have to learn this with circles. The circle is just a teaching tool to help you see function. But if you learn by just memorizing lists, bless your heart, write your lists on your test. You know, just you can write on the test, so it doesn't matter. To you. I just want right answers. Okay. So remember, country muscles, city muscles. Latissimus dorsi, teres major, shoulder extensors, adductors, internal rotators. And we see, we see, we see how we can visualize that with the circles. Posterior deltoid, it's an area of one muscle. Right? The deltoid is one muscle. And the posterior part is just an area, just like your upper pec is an area. What's the function of that area? It pulls in the direction of extension because it crosses posterior. It pulls in the direction of abduction because it crosses lateral. And it pulls in the direction of external or lateral rotation based on how it's trying to spin the merry-go-round by the polar axis. Remember, MD is middle, not medial. It's in the middle because it's actually lateral to the arm, right? Medial and lateral, medial is on the inside, lateral is on the outside. I think I suggested you guys to connect those as well, right? To, to make sure you know that's one muscle that's just balancing on. Uh, biceps break by long head, biceps break by short head, coracle brachialis. Man, there's a lot of bar references. I see corner bar. How about we do some, well, if there's no questions about circle layout or function or stretching, right? Like if the latissimus dorsi is a shoulder extensor, I need to lengthen it by flexing the shoulder, right? And if it's an adductor, I need to abduct. If it's an internal rotator, I need to external rotate. All, all of those kind of things, I think by now, should be three foot putts. Whatever directions these things pull by moving in the opposite direction, you're going to find your fall lengthen those muscles. Okay? So let's do some uh, practice examples. Okay. How about we do this? Okay, guys, um, forgive me for, this is what I call a Bigfoot picture, because you know how every picture of Bigfoot is blurry? Okay, so this is a Bigfoot picture. Blurry. Are you working different muscles if he internally rotates versus external rotates in this exercise? Different muscles or the same muscles? same muscles. So the motion has nothing to do with who's working. You have different motions, but same muscles. Right? So how can we communicate something that's the same even though we have different motions? And that's because we name muscles not because of motion, but because of their direction of pull. That's going to be the same. The way they pull doesn't change. What changes the link between those two concepts? Same direction of pull, different motions. What connects those two is contraction type. Right? Concentric versus eccentric contraction type 
is what's going to get something that pulls the same way to be responsible for different motions. Yes? Okay? External forces trying to internally rotate you. We don't need those. We need external rotators. So, knowing that you need external rotators here, your circles didn't tell you who you needed. Your circles just helped to remind you who are the ones that are most involved. Who, who in that group are uh, the biggest contributors. So, who are your major contributors to pulling in the direction of external rotation? Posterior deltoid, right? That area of the deltoid, not the whole delt, because the anterior fibers don't pull that way, the middle fibers don't pull that way. So just the posterior fibers pull that way. Who else we have? Infraspinatus, teres minor. And those muscles are going to be working whether you make it externally rotate through concentric work or let it internally rotate through eccentric work. It's the same muscles pulling in the same direction, working differently. The contraction work is different. So again, can everybody see why if, if we think of muscle function as motion, then if, whether they're internally rotating, external rotating, they trip up a lot of people. Because then they may put the wrong muscles because I may say internal rotation. <laughs> and you may say, oh, that must be pecs and the lats. And they're like, no, nah, that internal rotation was because of muscles that were pulling in the direction of external They're eccentric. And once again, I'm going to call it uh, Campbell's Law, but it's not like anything rocket science. It's that it's impossible to look natural while you're taking a photo while doing an exercise. So it's impossible. Impossibility. Okay, let's do another. Ooh, look at that guy, Dr. Octopus. Tim Tebow working on. This is actually hurting my shoulders, just looking at that. So one of the things I'm going to teach you guys, I know you've been introduced to this concept, but we're just going to look at it specifically for in, in, in terms of human uh, mechanics, biomechanics. But the weight stays the exact same. Uh, in other words, the, the mass, the stuff of his arm and the dumbbell is the same, whether it's at his side or whether it's out here. The, the stuff is the same, but you know that it's harder to hold it out here and you are here, and that's because the moment the torque changes. So the weight stays the same, but the rotational influence changes. And we're going to get into that when we uh, do the, the physics part of natural new muscles. But, but again, this should just kind of be common sense, where you may not be able to explain it in terms of numbers, but you just kind of know that there's something harder about the stuff out here than the stuff. Okay, what group of muscles at the shoulder do we need to make a phone call to to do this job? Do we need adididididas or abababas? Yeah, we need some abababas, right? And we need it the whole time. The only time we would need adididididas is if for some crazy reason you just want to slam the weights into the side. Probably not going to happen. So you need abs the whole time. Making it ab and then letting it ab. So again, the consistency isn't motion and the consistency isn't contraction. The, consensus, the consistency is the direction of pull of the muscles that we need for this exercise. The muscles that we need the entire time pull in a direction of abduction. 
making me add dot through concentric work and then letting me add dot through recentric work. The contraction type is what tie those two together. Who are your major players of abduction? Your deltoid. And, and we don't have to go redundant here. We don't have to say anterior, posterior, and middle deltoid. Because when you say deltoid and you end it like that, that infers all the fibers and infers everything. We only have to go into it when we only need certain parts. So if you say deltoid, you mean all the parts. Right, which one of our rotator cuff can also pull in that direction? Our, our, the one above the spine, right? So what do we call above the spine? Supra, supraspinatus. And then that biceps brachii long head has a lateral pull to it. Remember how I said they kind of crisscross applesauce? They're very sisterly at the shoulder. We're going to get into the scapula stuff um, uh, next, how, how muscles of the scapula um, can also help reposition and help. Let's see, what muscles do you think this gentleman would be using at the wrist as a rigid link to prevent right, his wrist from moving. You have to have some muscles doing a job to create rigidity here. Not so much at the elbow sometimes, because what's really cool about the elbow is that we can position it where the ligaments, as long as we're not in the elbow sagittal plane, if we're in the elbow strong plane, we can actually have ligaments kind of create rigidity there. But at the wrist, what do you think he's going to need in this position? Do you think he's going to need wrist flexors or wrist extensors? Extensors. So let's practice who are those. We got our extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis, extensor carpi omeris. And they're doing a job. They're working to prevent the wrist from doing that job. Stabilizers, if you want to look at it like that. Even if you could even that, sometimes these kind of secondary functions play fast and loose. You could actually look at it as a neutralizer too, because it's neutralizing the way one flexion. It's all as long as you talk about what the job is, it's doing a job to keep your wrist here so that it doesn't do this. Okay, how about this exercise? Remember, the circles don't tell you if they're working. That's what, that's what 310 was. But the circles help to remind you who is working once you identify the group that is doing the job, right? So, external force is trying to flex or extend your shoulders. Extend. So, if we did, you can even do a thought experiment. If we did recruit those muscles, you Throw the, you throw the bar into your legs. You don't need that. You need your shoulder flexors, right? Um, I am not going to get into, guys, the rabbit hole goes kind of deep in biomechanics. It, it can go deep. So for the context of this test, man, we got to start somewhere. So I'm not going to give you the, remember we talked about uh, uh, midway muscles and reposition. I'm not going to be like, well, because I'm internally rotated, now my middle delt can be a shoulder flex. It, it, it gets to that level, 
But we're, we're, we're just trying to keep it simple. The only midway muscles, I told you how I'm, I'm introducing you to those concepts. But all I'm asking you to do is say, hey, I need some shoulder flexors. Which ones did Campbell give me uh, that's going to contribute pulling in the direction of shoulder flexors? So don't, don't overthink it. It's just going to be the ones I held you accountable for and the ones that I told you I'm going to be held accountable for. Do I introduce you to a few midway muscles? Yes, the obvious ones. The ones that are super duper obvious because I know many of you are going to go on and have to learn <laughs> the other types of midway muscles. So I just want to introduce you to those concepts with some obvious ones. Okay? So the major ones, and listen, at the end of the day, this is, this is true. Always the priority, the biggest contributors are always your country muscles. <laughs> that should make sense because the country muscles are the bigger muscles. So if, if you're ever like, well, you know, yeah, the anterior deltoid, that's a country muscle, and the clavicular pec, that's a country muscle. Man, this little biceps break guy, short head, and that coracle breaks, and that doesn't look like a lot of meat. And you're right. <laughs> it's not, they're, they're, they're kind of secondary. It's not a lot of meat on the bone. Country muscles. So you look at your circle and you say, all right, let me try to account for all the ones that are anterior, all the ones in the front. Um, not the whole pectoralis major, only the clavicular fibers, right? So that would be one of those, hey, only this part of the fan pulls in a direction vertical. Anterior portion of the deltoid draws forward. Uh, short head of the biceps brachii, long head of the biceps brachii, and then the sister muscle to the biceps brachii, short head that over again. Okay. 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 This guy reminds me, did anybody ever watch the new flesh? Anyone ever watch the new Harry Potter movies? That, that, that dude who can like turn into that spirit or whatever? Yeah, that's who that dude reminds me. Okay, Brian, let's see what else we got. Hey guys, why don't y'all do this one together? Uh, I say together. Um, just maybe talk about it. Okay, here's, uh, let's do some clarification. So, we know practically that we don't really live in the robot world. So, um, remember in 310, robot world is like pure set, right? and everything is combinational. And, and things like pull-ups, and but it's no different. You, it, it's it's impossible to really have perfect. You, you're going to be in this combination. And so, how do I communicate? Is by giving things like planes, right? So I'll be like, uh, uh, what muscles would be contributing in the shoulders frontal plane? Where that would be the adductor pull or. And I'd be like, okay, well, if we do it like this, what muscles would be contributing in the shoulder in the central plane? Well, that would be the extensor pull. You know, so you, you get this combination stuff happening in a lot of these functions. And how we differentiate is with planes. Okay. So let's let's say frontal, because I can give you an example that's most all sagittal, you know, if we do uh, like a reverse grip. Okay, so so for these kind of wider grip or prone position ones. That's, these are the ones that I'm going to say, hey, what's happening in the frontal plane? Not that you can't have some sagittal stuff, it's just I'm not asking you about the sagittal stuff. I'm just asking you about the frontal stuff. Do you think we need abductors or do we need adductors for this exercise? Ad yeah. Because if he relaxes everything, you're going to have abduction. And you're not, you're not pushing yourself down, right? Pulling yourself up. 
So the big, the big country muscles that pull in the direction of adduction. And we got some big players, man. We got some horses. We got some horses. Remember though that the pectoralis major can't really help until you get past nine degrees, which is actually kind of cool. Because you kind of need a second wind. When, when you're here and those muscles are stretched and they can kind of get you going, you know how sometimes you kind of hit that halfway part and you kind of need a little second wind to kind of keep you going? That's a lot of range of motion here. So that's kind of cool that once you get down, your pec can be like, dude, I can, I can give you a little bit of extra help to get you up. You know, imagine you're trying to pull yourself up on a cliff or something. Getting that extra help uh, could be very beneficial. Latissimus dorsi. Big, powerful country muscle, man. Terry's major, it's sister muscle, big, powerful posterior deltoid. Um, now, the posterior deltoid wouldn't be, it would be non-traditional. The posterior deltoid, oh, Brian, shut up. That's some midway stuff. That, that's, that's me planting seeds that, like, when you, when you internally rotate, you go here, your middle, your middle can pull forward now. And when you externally rotate and you're doing this, <laughs> now you, you know, it's like, it's almost like having a component of horizontal adduction. So on the test, all I'm going to hold you accountable for is what's here. And then in graduate school, dude, you can go forward into that rabbit hole and learn more about how that biceps can spiral around and be a midway muscle and how the deltoids based on your position can, can switch. It's all cool that will not be on your test. I'm introducing you to midway muscles, but I need to remember not to talk about every single one that, that comes to, to my head. That's my fault. Um, triceps brachii is an adductor, just, just the long head, right? The long head um, pulls in a direction of adduction uh, so that it could be a contributor as well. Okay? So, pec major when we're under 90, left dorsi, teres major, triceps brachii. What if I asked you, uh, how would you stretch? The subscapularis. What position would you want to put the shoulder in? What's that? Retraction. So retraction is a scapular motion, right? And the subscap works at the glenohumeral joint. So we need. So we need. So I'm not saying that those can't go together, like in, a, in, in an overall stretch. But if I'm asking you about a shoulder muscle, we need to give a shoulder motion. External rotation because the, the subscap is an internal rotator, right? So, so you're right, they're going to go hand in hand together because usually when you externally rotate, you retract the scapula. But we need to remember that if it's a shoulder functioning muscle, we got to answer it in a shoulder uh, position. So, we need to externally rotate to lengthen an internal spin, right? A muscle that pulls in the direction of internal rotation. Remember, I thought, I thought uh, you, uh, our, our athletic trainers, we may already know this, which is pretty cool, but that bicep root is actually formed by the, by the evolutionary tugging of our rotator cuff muscles, the two in the back and the one in the front, and, and, and you get a wolf's law, and you get these little extra little bony growths to help with the, with the mechanical pull, and, and you got the two in the back and the one in the front, and over time it forms that little softness that, that, that's in the front, so that's really cool. Okay. All right, how would you stretch? Um, how would you stretch the Terry's major? Terry's major. The, the, the key thing here is not to confuse majors and minors, right? So, so Terry's and then minor or major. Uh, they don't have the same function, right? The minor is here, the major is there. Internal rotator versus an external rotator. Actually, the major is, because it's pulling on kind of the neck, it actually has shoulder function 
uh, at the anterior posterior bilateral axis. The reason that infraspinatus and teres minor don't have function in the satchel and AP is because they're just on the ball. They're, they're pulling on the axis themselves. But when you get down to the neck, <laughs> then you can start pulling in a direction of adduction and extension and stuff. But when you're pulling on the head itself, the only axis you cross is <coughs> oh. Okay. So that's a common missed one because teres is the same, but they don't have the same function. They have different functions. Okay. Let's talk about horizontal AB and AD deductors. Uh, I'm going to give you the so what. All country muscles. All I'm going to hold you accountable for are big country muscles. Okay. So imagine repositioning yourself here and saying horizontal adductors want to pull this way and horizontal abductors want to pull that way. So I am not holding you account because again, if you think about it, this is all grad school stuff, just planting seeds that some of you are going to tackle one day. If you think about that subscapularis pulling here, well, as you do this, it's the pull across. And you think about these lateral rotators that when you're here, are trying to spin like this, but when you're here, they're trying to pull like this. Now, they still have the same stability function because they're still drawing the head in, right? But as you bring your arms out, they have less and less spin component and more and more this kind of thing. It's kind of cool. So, um, so, horizontal adductors, all I'm gonna hold you accountable for. Now, this is one where you can draw a little asterisk, you can do color coding, Remember, the functions of these are anatomical. So this is outside of anatomical. You can almost look at it as, as kind of a midway thing, where when I'm in a new position, these are, but all I'm holding you accountable for is horizontal adductor, pectoralis major, because if you think about it, when we're at 90 degrees, uh -huh. <laughs> everything's trying to pull you, everything's trying to pull your humerus to your sternum. Pavicular, sternal, doesn't matter. Get over here. So that's a big player in your anterior deltoid. The anterior part of your deltoid is a big player. I'm not going to worry about, yeah, you got a core code with your bicep. Those little city muscles, we're just, I'm just going to give you the so what? Because we're venturing away from anatomical. So when we start to venture away from anatomical, I don't want to overload you uh, uh, with too many. Just give you the so what's. The so what's coming back should be pretty obvious. Your posterior deltoid, your latissimus dorsi, and your teres major. I, I can't give you the lat without the teres major because they hypotenuse. Remember from last class, uh, this might be a test question where um, uh, I need to find a way to ask it, but I think this would be a worthy test question. Right, remember we talked about this in class? And uh, So again, we learn things in robot world, but we don't live in robot world, man. We live in a combination of, of, of the Etch-a-Sketch knobs always moving together. So uh, yes, part of it is you don't have to, you don't have to do as much work because you don't have to go as far down, therefore you don't have to go as far. But the bigger thing here is that in terms of shoulder motion, you're not going pure horizontal adduction. You're doing a component of horizontal adduction and a component of regular adduction. 
You're, you're going across and down. And the pectoralis major can help you go across and down. And the latissimus dorsi and the teres major can help you go down. So you get the biggest of the baddest muscles to help pull in that combinational direction of across and down. You get some extra help. Especially anytime you can get the lat to do something, that's the odds are in your favor. <coughs> All right, let's review our rotator cuff muscles. So again, we're not gonna go into the rabbit hole too much. You might heard that the biceps right by the long hand is a rotator, but that's, that, I'm not saying that's not the case, but man, that's getting, that's really, really nice. Just the traditional ones, okay? Covering our bases, we got four bases, or three bases in a home plate. But we need to encapsulate that's the key thing. That's what kind of makes the biceps break guy and long head kind of the oddball out. Because although it does technically add some lateral stability, we're talking about muscles that literally encapsulate the head. Okay. Subscap in the front, infraspinatus teres minor in the back, supraspinatus over the top. Encapsulating that head, keeping that golf ball on that golf tee, and more importantly, not just to keep it in like this, but to draw it down, to draw that head down, so that way when you use these big country muscles to lift up, you have that force couple. Remember I talked about force couple? That if we don't have that uh, inferior draw, the humerus is gonna shift Arthrokinematically, it's going to shift up until that chromium pushes it down. Something's got to make the head go down. And if it's muscle, then your meat that lives in between these has space to breathe. But if it's bone pushing it down, then that bone's going to eventually uh, irritate that muscle that's on top of this. Okay. So, Rotator cuff muscles in terms of stability function, in terms of rotational function, that's when you look at them independent. So in other words, their angular function, we look at them as this muscle does this, this muscle does this, these muscles do that. But in terms of stability function, they're all working to keep uh, that golf ball on that golf team. Okay. All right, let's go to the scapula. Um, can someone confirm that I put these up on the Google? You might have did? Yeah. Okay, guys. The first one I'm going to talk about is the pectoralis minor. And... Um, this is a muscle that starts as origin on the ribs. I think it's like three through five, but basically it just goes to the ribs and it goes to the coracoid process. Now, this is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional concept. What I mean by that is when you look at this picture, the obvious pull is down, right? It's pulling on that scapula. The coracoid is part of the scapula, so if you have muscles and muscles can only pull, you can see the depression pull of that pretty easily. Does that make sense? The harder one to see here is the fact that the origin of that muscle is in the front and the coracoid process is more posterior to it. So what's harder to see from this picture is the anterior draw of that muscle. The fact that it's trying to pull the scapula forward. It's hard to see on this two-dimensional picture. Okay. So in addition to being a depressor, it's also a protractor, pulling in a direction of protraction. And then the coolest function, I'm about to give you a here. All right. I'm gonna represent the spine of the scapula like this. And we have the spine that's the closest 
to remember spine of the scapula, B spine. So we have a part of the spine of the scapula like a teeter totter. I want you to think of this as a teeter totter. You know how a teeter totter can do this? So we have the side closer to and the side further away. The acromion is on this kind of outside lateral part. I mean, if you look at it like this, I guess technically you can make it whatever you want. But the reality is, is that this acromion is literally <laughs> outside. It's a rinse. It's on this side of the teeter top. You're going to have some muscles that are trying to make the teeter top do this, that are pulling on this side, and you're going to have other muscles that are trying to do this, pulling on this side. So what I want you to remember is in terms of scapular rotation, this is upward, and this is downward, correct? So if I have a muscle that's pulling more on this side of the spine of the scapula because that acromion is on the, on the coracoid process is on the acromion side. This muscle is trying to do this. And what is this? Downward rotation. So the pectoralis minor is trying to rotate the teeter totter in a direction of downward rotation. So the pec minor, scapular protractor, scapular depressor, scapular downward rotate. Now, uh, verbiage, verbiage, verbiage. When we say the pecs, man, we have to really clarify what we mean by that. Now again, I'm not talking about lay people. Man, if you're working with a patient, they don't know what that is. But with us, we need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So when, some, when you're talking about someone's pecs, does that mean your right and your left pectoralis major? Does it mean your right and left pectoralis major and pectoralis minor? Does it mean your right pec major and pec minor? So typically, when you're talking about pec majors and minors, you're talking about them for different reasons. Pec major because of glenohumeral joint function, pec minor because of scapular function. Now, does the glenohumeral joint and scapular function together a lot? Of course they do. <laughs> scapular component, shoulder component. But the trap is that that muscle sure as heck is pulling very close to the humerus. And so it's easy to think that it's a shoulder functioning muscle. Especially when we think of the pecs. And we say working the pecs, and you say, well, what does the pecs mean? Pec major and minor. Well, the major works in the shoulder, so the minor must work in the shoulder. You see how it can kind of walk you down a path of loopsies. Pec major crosses the shoulder, functions in the shoulder. Pec minor does not. Pec minor functions at the scapula only. Cool? What is its function in the scapula? Depressor, protractor, downward rotating. Now, one thing I didn't do, I apologize, go to your scapula circle, because this is the one circle that is not a traditional cross section. And there's a reason for it. Remember in 310, um, the shoulder girdle, which of the following doesn't belong? Apple, banana, strawberry, sledgehammer, sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint, glenohumeral joint, scapula thoracic articulation. And the way the scapula fits back there, held together with negative pressure and muscles, and because most of the muscles that influence the scapula are pulling on the scapula, and the motions of the scapula orbiting the ribs is how we give perception to scapula motion. We are going to visualize this. Imagine. This is actually one that we visualize just like it is up on the In other words, we are literally looking at this. Spine. So you're going to have muscles that are pulling the scapula closer to the spine. On the inside, those are going to be our retractors. Muscles that are pulling the scapula further away from the spine, those are going to be our protractors. 
muscles that are pulling in a direction of elevation, muscles that are pulling in a direction of depression, muscles that are pulling in a direction of upper rotation, downward rotation. So the pectoralis minor is a depressor, protractor, downward rotator. I learned this stretch from a buddy of mine who's a sport chiropractor. And uh, he taught me this stretch for the pec minor. Or, and it's pretty good. But if you think about it, the, my arm's above my head, so I have upper rotation of the scapula, so it's being pulled. Then I'm trying to use the wall to retract my scapula. So it's a protractor. And then in addition to the upper rotation, I'm trying to elevate my scapula so it's being stretched as a depressor, as a protractor, and as a downward rotation. So in other words, knowing the functions can help you to create some pretty cool positions to try to optimize the whole thing. Next class, we're going to talk about the infamous serratus anterior. Love that muscle. That's a cool muscle. All right, guys, any questions? It feels like a Monday. It's not a Monday. It's a Friday. No school tomorrow. How are you doing?